Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zinger show with me, your host Agostino Zinger. This is episode number 151, Uno Cinco Uno. Hola a todos, mi nombre es Agostino. ¿Qué tal? Great. Hope you're doing well. I'm doing amazing. It's a nice sunny morning this Wednesday morning. I have um, just come back from the gym as usual with my um, entire repertoire for the week. It involves strenuous exercise, strenuous meditation, which I've not got on top of. And it's weird, isn't it? I can do the exercise thing, right? I found the eating thing not too difficult. Some some speed bumps here and there. But the meditation thing is just so hard to do. I think the longest I, d- I did... Um, consecutive days was maybe 13 or 14 days when i was using headspace that's a guided meditation app that was probably the first on the scene now there's like a millions of apps out there i think the big the kind of like hip one nowadays people are using is a calm um there's another one called oak by the same guy that's made zero the fasting app that i use um there's waking up by sam harris he has one there's a few uh, meditation apps out there but essentially they they work the same sort of way right you have like a guided meditation like a person speaking that guides you through um some breathing exercises so you can kind of watch your breath and kind of think of nothing but then you know the irony of it is as, as soon as a person's voice comes over the voiceover like oh now open your eyes right you suddenly you know, realize that you're listening to someone's voice and you're not in the moment anymore but um they do a good job regardless right meditation is great it's meant to be you're meant to get centered meant to make you present um but i was listening actually to a, a podcast interview yesterday um sam harris has got a podcast um now it's called making sense it was called waking up now it's called making sense um check it out on itunes um sam harris making sense and he interviews the you know the legendary stephen fry you know comedian um intellectual historian you know the kind of all around kind of amazing good guy and stephen fry is basically telling um um sam harris on the podcast that um, even though he's, tra- he's tried using his app and he's tried meditating, he still has reservations behind it. And one of the reservations behind meditation is that he feels like meditation is going to kind of blunt his sword. Like he feels like maybe the kind of anger and the frustration that he feels in his life is what kind of drives him to ask interesting questions, right? To think about things, to challenge ideas and, you know, to just to be the contrarian that he is. And he sometimes thinks that maybe meditating will kind of turn him to like a dullard, Right. And um, I can some I can sympathize with that uh, somewhat because I do remember in the first fourteen or the first the fourteen days or so that I was meditating using Headspace, I did realize that I did start to um, um, I did start to notice how calm and and less frantic I was right. And I'm always not sure whether or not I liked it or not. I'm not sure whether or not the kind of like you know my constant babbering and my machine gun fire way of speaking and my frantic mo- um, and my lack of um staying still and the fact that i'm always you know looking for the next opportunity and shit. i'm not sure whether or not that was a that's actually a, a good thing that parts m- that makes me who i am or whether i should try and harness that and try and kind of direct it into the paths that it needs to go into it in order to kind of make my life you know calmer throughout i don't know i don't know i'm a bit in two minds about it i haven't really thought about it um i haven't really come to a decision that's what's the best course. But I do know anyway, regardless that, you know, part of the reason why I started the podcast was because I have a lot of inner dialogue in my head, right? I have a lot of um, things I think about, a lot of things I kind of like ruminate over, a lot of things I'm kind of, you know, just, you know, trying to decide whether or not I agree with things I see online, I agree with things I might watch. I don't know, just little thoughts and whatever. And podcasting was a good way to kind of, you know, verbally diarrhea all over the fucking interwebs, the stuff that I was thinking in my head. And so far, so good, man. I think you know especially since i've been keeping up the schedule of making sure that i do it quite regularly i've kind of noticed a really big change in my overall uh, mental clarity my lack of anxiety if i did have any i don't think i did to be honest i'm not gonna suddenly start saying i had mental health issues because i didn't um but i've noticed you know by by and large i'm i'm a fairly calm individual now i don't necessarily get um worried or panicked about things i never did personally um but I've kind of seen a big difference now since I've been doing a podcast regularly. And I'm not sure whether or not I should just do what some people do and kind of substitute one thing for the other. You know, people say, oh, no, running is like meditating to me. Eh, no, it isn't. You know, meditating is meditating. Running is running. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to turn into one of those people that I hate. So I'm not going to try and do that. I'm going to try and um, I'm going to try and do it, to be honest. I'm, I'm going to try. I'm going to try and do it. And maybe it's me saying I'm going to try to do it means I'm not going to do it. But I, I want to give it a go, man. I really do. I think it's going to really help me um, in my path going forward. 
Anyway, um, that was a little short soliloquy that I just thought about now. I'm going to read you something because, you know, reading something is always really important, right? Reading little tidbits and stuff. And I've always found, and I don't know, throughout the years, I've had this for maybe, what, two years now, right? And I've read it dated every day since I've had it, right? The Daily Stoic by Ryan Holiday. This book right here, right? So um, daily bits of wisdom that are going to take you through the day. And this one for January the 30th kind of stuck out to me. And I'm going to read out to you now. Um, it says, you don't have to stay on top of everything. <clears throat> the quote on top says, if you wish to improve, be content to appear clueless or stupid in extraneous matters. Don't wish to seem knowledgeable. And if some regard you as important, distrust yourself. Epicetus. I 100% agree. That's been my MO for like the longest time. Like I always, it always really, it always really um, baffled me. I think especially when I entered the startup world, I think that's when I started to kind of interact with loads of like pseudo intellectuals and loads of people that, you know, kind of acted like they know what they were talking about when they didn't really. Because I guess, you know, the very nature of startup land, um, you know, part of its problem, you know, the fact that, you know, it's wild, wild west and anyone can just come in and set up camp and, you know, uh, start a company off a whim is also um the good thing about it right um no well i'm uh, sorry the benefit of someone being able to do that come in with just some money as long as you got some capital right and you can maybe secure a loan or two you can you can buy some laptops whatever get yourself an office you can basically start a company in a span of a week maybe even less right that's a good thing but the on the negative side of things it, do, it does invite like um you know chances into the arena people who necessarily don't have any place um, trying to run a company or trying to do anything of that kind of ilk are now doing it. And um, in that arena, of course, you've got people that kind of have to just justify their position, justify their role, justify their salary. So they sometimes um, over... Um, I don't know, how do you say? Um, we we'll say they overestimate, but, you know, they, they put a, too much importance on what they know. And when, in reality, I was always of the, of the thinking that you should put more importance on stuff that you don't know, right? Be open to people... Uh, telling you things that you had no idea about um i remember a lesson that my dad taught me a long time ago when i was a kid i'm not sure why this came up or why he said it to me or why the occasion was but I remember i think it might have been because when i was younger i always used to say stuff like oh yeah i know i know i know i know i remember i think it might be something to do with those kind of things right so someone's telling me a story i'd be like oh yeah, yeah, yeah i heard about it, i heard about it, i heard about that right and i think my dad kind of got annoyed with it and he told me once that um the key to wisdom is to pretend like even the stuff that you know about pretend you don't know about and let the other person tell you and then when i got older i started to realize that doing that in a conversation really um um if you're if you're involved if you're trying to like you know improve your persuasion skills or your networking skills that's a great way of doing it right when you're meeting new people instead of telling them who you are and what you do ask questions um be intrigued not like fake intrigue, like, oh, yeah, oh, I'm nodding, right? Actually genuinely fascinated. Oh, wow. So you work at BT. Jesus, man. So um, were you around when that big uh, data breach happened? How was it in a company? Was that something that affected you guys? I don't know the role. How long they've been there? Like, seem, act genuinely interested. Like, try and be interested in what people have to say as opposed to what you have to say. Then what happens is that even, even if you have a strong opinion, what it will do is that it will either reaffirm what you already think or it will completely um, um, do away with the ideas you had previously, which is great because, again, um, wisdom is kind of having some knowledge that you have, stored knowledge, and then when new information comes along, you can discard the old knowledge you have and take on a new knowledge. That's wisdom, right? We've, we've seen what wisdom doesn't look like, right, in politics nowadays where someone makes a mistake or someone says something stupid, and instead of coming out and apologizing the normal way, they'll just double down on it, right? The whole doubling down thing has, you know, spurned, that's kind of come to fruition maybe in the last few years or so i think so maybe in media maybe it was around before that but we know we know that looks quite stupid right we know that quite looks quite foolhardily right you've obviously been proved wrong and your ego is so big that you feel like you know you can't admit your mistake so you'd rather just double down or change the narrative in order not to make you look like you're wrong but it's not about being wrong or right it's you know life is a learning experience we can we're constantly moving we're constantly growing if someone else comes along and tells you some new information why not take it? It doesn't matter who it's coming from. Doesn't wanna. Doesn't even matter the intention. Really, I'd much rather be. Um, I'd much rather be. I'd much rather have the right information, have the wrong information. That that's it. that being said. So my favorite phrase in conversation, especially in group conversations, are oh really? I didn't know that. Oh wow, those are my favorite phrases. Like I don't start with my own stories. I don't get into that whole thing. If anything, the only place where I kind of falter and I kind of stumble a bit is when people start talking about holidays. 
automatically like I start to kind of mention my things as well where I went um, and it kind of turns into like a bit of a travel tennis match right oh I went there 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 right and you can get annoying and we've all been in those kind of places in dinners um, house parties where you know you bump into that kind of you know avid traveler person the person that's always talking about traveling is going to change your life like for you it did not for everyone right some people just don't care about traveling so they're always kind of you know preaching and hypothesizing um, about um, traveling it's kind of in a way in a weird like you know religious manner right um, the same way how people get annoyed with people that get born again um, you know recently in their kind of adult age and they start talking about Christ every damn day we get it that you're passionate about it but maybe not everyone else has the same passion about it so um, I know what that looks like but I don't know what is about me when someone talks about it suddenly I want to m- maybe it's just the um, excitement right it makes me remember all the good times I had right and I kind of want to oh yeah I went there I went there as well and also sometimes I get the impression when you're talking to somebody that's the avid traveler person and they're giving you their big kind of soliloquy, their big story about where they went. I always sometimes feel like, um, like when they're telling you the story and you're just listening and just kind of being attentive and kind of, you know, really engrossed in their story and you're trying to, you know, um, pay attention or whatever it may be and be present. I always get the impression that somehow in the back of their mind, they think, oh, this guy's a loser. He hasn't been anywhere. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I don't know why. Again, that's me probably projecting and stuff, whatever, but that's something that's it's always in the back of my head. But um, yeah, that quote is something that I hold quite dear. Uh, don't pretend to know everything. I think that's the last word it says here. If you wish to improve, be content to appear clueless or stupid in extraneous matters. Don't wish to seem knowledgeable. And if some regard you as important, distrust yourself, which is great, right? That's the that's what as well you saw. I, I, I kind of saw um, in the beginning, the kind of contrast um, in intros uh sam harris with stephen fry so sam harris interviewed stephen fry you know an amazing dude who's kind of got you know a million different he's kind of the real definition of of a polymath right a real definition of a renaissance man something that i've kind of always hoped to be right a renaissance man your expertise in you know um cover a wide range of fields right you're you're, you're talent here 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 you have output there 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 there, there. so stephen fry is probably the living embodiment of that Sam Harris introduced him in the podcast. He says all stuff he does. He says he's amazing. He says, oh, how do you even, what do you even say your job is? Like, he's giving him the whole kind of big pat on the back speech. And then, you know, um, Sam, Stephen Fry, basically to kind of, you know, summarize what he says, he's some, something along the lines of, oh, I think the only reason why I do all these things is because I'm not talented at one thing. I'm a bit of a generalist. And like, do you know what I mean? And then, and obviously Sam Harris kind of laughs and says, oh, like you're being obviously awfully humble, right? And I saw, and I thought it's funny because if you listen to other interviews with Sam Harris with other public intellectuals who are maybe american or what let's say whenever they get introduced in a really like convoluted way like oh my god he did this he did that he won that he won this they always like oh thank you very much i'm glad to be here they accept that praise it's a difference in culture whereas i think brits and maybe europeans at best we kind of we're a little bit shy we shy away from it oh you're amazing you did that you did this like yeah yeah i know but it's a team it's a team game i'm happy you're the team one you don't want to put too much praise in yourself but and i think sometimes it can come across a bit you know um, it can come across a bit, a bit fake, but I think by and large that mindset allows you to keep growing, right? The idea that you're not shit, the idea that you know you're only as good as your last work, the idea that your last work doesn't even matter, right? The idea that you're always growing. I think that actually allows you to grow. I think the moment you start accepting that you know I'm this person, I'm that person, I did this, I did this, I did this, is the moment you kind of lose. I would assume again, just from me personally, maybe it's a, maybe it's a different in culture, but I don't know. But anyway, that being said, welcome back to the podcast. It's Wednesday morning. Um, just chilling, drinking water. I'm gonna go through some topics of stuff I've seen over the week. Talking about water. God damn it, man! I've been intermittent fasting this last couple of weeks, uh, sixteen hours a day for maybe four days a week, and I found it heavenly. I find it so awesome. I find it so calming. I find it so um, stress-free. Um, I've never really been the biggest foodie in the world, right? I think I had my little period in the beginning of the, or maybe 2005, 2000, let's say 8 to 2010, right? Where I was kind of running around looking at food trucks and going to street food markets and shit. And I cared about that. What's that street in it, Old Street, where it does all the street food stuff? Uh, by the way, you know stuff like Brewick Street in um in Central London. I cared about those kind of places. Right, I'd go on the weekend. I'd be checking Time Out magazine and seeing what's happening next. I really gave a shit. Um, and then I think it kind of evolved, and now I care probably more about restaurants. Right, so I'm checking um blogs like Cheese and Biscuits, which is probably one of my favorite websites. Um, it's written by a food critic called Chris Pohl. 
um check it out um cheese and biscuits or cheese and and biscuits uh dot com it's a great little food review site any kind of um, restaurant review site and he goes to all the kind of great hip restaurants before they're kind of big reviews them and you can kind of um follow his lead but um i've kind of grown out of that whole foodie thing i'm not that big of a foodie if i am i'll try and go out and get lunch or try and get out and go out and buy something but for the most part at home i try i usually eat the same thing again and again like i've probably been eating a chicken salad or a variation of that for i think maybe a year so that's basically what i do and um but still even with that kind of way of eating i still always found um i found eating quite stressful which is weird because i don't know i don't really get stressed about most things but i find eating stressful because of the idea of like having to buy things having to make sure your fridge is full when you came back from work and you just the last thing you went to was go to tesco's again even if tesco express even though it's really quick and it's a really small little supermarket the last thing you want to do is stand in line and whatever it's just it's annoying right and plus like i'm not sure about you guys but when i come back from work and i'm tired and i don't have anything in the fridge and i have to go to tesco express and then you're in there and you're because tesco express you know it's it's you know it's a smaller supermarket right and it's priced like an off license basically so you haven't you're spending much more money you're spending a whole lot more money than you would do if you went to your regular supermarket to do your weekly shop so you end up spending like i don't know 15 pounds on stuff that's only gonna last you three days you're like oh do you know what i mean you're like just annoyed and it always causes me stress, right? The idea of having to eat and when I'm going to eat, what I'm going to eat, where I'm going to go, blah, blah, blah. It just annoyed me, like going to prep and seeing all the options just like it made my head spin. So um, when I started working out and started getting into dieting and all that sort of stuff, even though um, the benefits of it was mostly to do with your, you know, your weight, what you look like. One of the things that really hit home to something that I really kind of um, treasured and thought, oh, oh God, I'm so happy I found this was the mental clarity, the peace of mind I had knowing I was training, I was dieting, and I was eating a certain way. It made life so much easier, honestly. Like, I know for some people it's the opposite of that because, you know, uh, dieting and, you know, um, um, intermittent fasting or working out is in some ways, in some people, they kind of categorize that as like a, as like a punishment, right? As like you're denying yourself certain things. But in my head, it kind of just freed it up. It kind of made me think, okay, like in, on on sometimes I remember in last year, not now, because I'm being quite clean. Last year I'll be like, oh, if I'm gonna eat this biscuit, I'm just gonna eat again for 16 hours. Like I'll decide then, right? So I'd kind of like fast then to kind of offset the benefits of the biscuit of the the next of the biscuit, which obviously isn't a good idea. But it just allowed me to be much more calm with my eating, man. Like for now, I have like an eating window. For instance, I'm probably gonna have my last meal maybe at like 3 p.m. later today when I go to work at lunch, right? And then um that'll be it. I want to have lunch again. I want to have anything to eat again the whole day, right? Um, and I just find that so calming, especially because especially if I've gone out or if I've had a good time, I went went to a party or something. The last thing I want to do is go to a party on my way home, then decide I want to eat something. I have to buy something on the way home at nine or ten p.m. and that's just not having a good idea having that sit in your stomach. And my life has been so much better for it. And I really recommend it, man. The mental clarity, the boosting energy for, for the intermittent fasting has been amazing. Really, really cool. Um, for the most part, diet-wise, I'm following a pretty basic, I think, low-carb diet. I'm not really eating carbs for the most part. I have, like, basically eggs and, you know, that's it for the morning. Chicken salad and for lunch. And then maybe, um, or like a banana in the middle, like for lunchy kind of thing. And chicken salad um, for lunch, dinner, which is quite a big portion, to be honest. And then that's it. And I just basically go to sleep. Um, I sleep really easy. I wake up super easy. And I just, again, like I said, the boost in energy, the mental clarity has been something I can't recommend any more highly. So, um, and then to track it, I'll use this app called Zero, which is an app I've been using for a while now. And it helps you track all your kind of dieting stuff. So that's the app that I use there on the screen, Zero. Um, there's a guy called uh, Kevin Rose who makes this. And he's also the guy behind the app called Oak, which is a meditation app. So I recommend you check that out. But yeah, um, intermittent fasting for me has been amazing. I do 16 hours a day. Sometimes I can stretch it to 18 or 20. But for the most part, 16 has been pretty good for me. And I've got the results I've been I needed, really, for the most part. Um, yeah, recommend it. Anyways, um, on to the topics today. Number one, number one, number one, number one. So I've been um, finished. I finished up reading or listening to the. Um, oh, wait, what is it doing this for? Stop. So I finished up read. I, I, I finished up. Um, what is it doing this for? I finished up listening to the. 
the Leonardo da Vinci autobiography by Walter Isaacson. Walter Isaacson, if you're not familiar with him, is the guy that wrote the amazing, amazing, amazing autobiography on Steve Jobs. So before he died, Steve Jobs reached out to Walter Isaacson because he's kind of famous for writing autobiographies. I think he wrote one on the former US president. I forgot the name of it, but he's famous for writing really great biographies. And Steve, Steve Jones, I mean, Steve Jobs reached out to him when he kind of got the diagnosis that he was going into remission. And he kind of, um, through the period, I think maybe a process of maybe six months or something along those kind of lines, um, Walter Isaacson and Steve Jobs kind of spoke and Steve Jobs spoke quite candidly about his story about his come up and everything that happened to his family really um I know some secrets that we had no idea about about his kind of stepdad and all this sort of stuff about so his biological dad loads of really amazing things um and um and uh, and now he's kind of followed it up with a, a autobiography on on, on uh, Leonardo da Vinci right one of the most kind of important um contemporary on oh, no, important art figures you know in history let's let, let's say right and um I think there's been a lot there's been a lot said about docu series happening nowadays right on Netflix and stuff I think the Ted Bundy uh, docu series now is getting a lot of hype obviously but um I think the stuff that Walks that Axel has been doing especially with the Steve Jobs book especially with the Leonardo da Vinci book I'm surprised hasn't been um, adapted to screen I think the Steve Jobs one maybe did with the movie by with that starred Michael Fassbender but I'm sure it didn't get any good reviews I'm not too sure what someone use i don't know but i really like to see um somebody adapt the Leonardo da vinci book into some sort of docuseries the book's probably too long to you know to cover entirely but front to back but some of the things in it man about Leonardo da vinci's life like his upbringing his upbringing the way he looks at life like his fascination with army generals and that kind of masculine image he's kind of he's under ambiguity behind his sexuality um the way he used to procrastinate so much he never really finished things um his tendency not to bend or you know uh jump by the sound of his clients and stuff um the fact that he only did portraits of people that he liked or he admired like really amazing things you just read about you like fuck man this guy was truly awesome um and then it, obviously lo looking into it more i kind of stumbled upon this amazing uh portrait called the the salvador mundi it's a depiction of christ that's you know da vinci uh painted a long time ago and it kind of you know it plays with so many things from perception to depth of field to the use of shadow and softness on the face it's amazing portrait i'm going to put it up here on the screen for using oh, those of you watching it via youtube and it's an amazing sort of portrait of christ you might have seen it before it's sort of, sort of like a portrait of christ he's holding up two hands he's holding up a hand with two fingers pointed up and he's got sort of like a clear globe in his in his in his uh uh, palm of his hand and staring straight out but the face is really softened it sort of it looks like there's a permanent halo around his face right with a really dark background and if you look closely at the ball itself um there's loads of plays on perception you know he kind of used it it's, it's just a clever way of of, of 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 painting um so supposedly this painting itself went on auction the other day and not the other day but a while back um when 2017 and sold for 450 million dollars Four hundred fifty million dollars it sold for, insane, right? Uh, play a little video here for the New York Times that kind of talks about it. Um, hopefully this doesn't get me taken off YouTube, but let me play it here quickly. Seventy million. Let's see about this. So this is in auction, right? For this flipping video. Seventy million. Back to France last time. At three hundred and seventy million. It's at Christie's. Oh. Oh. Four hundred and fifty million. Insane. How important art is, right, to to humanity is just... But that's like a, you know... Money can't really buy that, to be honest. 150 million is a part, probably a bargain for what it is. I wonder who bought it. Was it a Russian oligarch or something along those kind of lines? But anyway, th th that's the footage from um, from Christie's or the sale of the auction. And um, this basically article basically says that potentially um, Walter Isaacson's book played a role in the kind of, you know, in the surge of its kind of... Uh, in the upsurge of the of the price of the actual piece of art itself which i thought was quite interesting and um, with that being said if it's that if it, if the book was that important why doesn't somebody make a docuseries about this man leon da vinci i'm not sure if people are interested in, not as probably as sexy as uh, ted bundy and the like but i think that story is fascinating personally um and yeah i recommend you check it out it's a again leon da vinci autobiography by well you know um 
semi autobiography by uh, uh, Walter Iggerson. It's an amazing tome. Yeah, I, I read it via Audible, so you can check check that out. And you can use my link as well below at audible.com for just Aggie to get one free book credit and a 30 day free trial to check it out for yourself. Um, what else is on the list here? Da, 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 da. Let's go, let's go. Oh, so have you seen this, right? So this came out the other day. There's a there's a book that's out now at the Idea Bookstore, one of my favorite bookstores. They've got like a little um shelf or corner, sorry, shelf. They've got a little um corner in Dover Street Market where they sell amazing books, um, loads of stuff, um, loads of one-off books and magazines and all that malarkey that you can find there. They've got those amazing tote bags and t-shirts they do that say drugs, techno that you see people might be wearing and shit. Just an amazing all-round kind of collection of stuff. Um, they recently um, released or put out this book, um, which is ba effectively like an archive of all of Raf Simmons' pieces or the most important pieces from his um, time at his label. Um, Raf Simmons from like, was it 1996 or 2006? Um, they're releasing two volumes, right? I think they're like 200 pounds um, each, right? And they're, you know, I'm assuming they're going to be, uh, they're probably going to fly off the shelf if they're not already fly off the shelf already and it throws up an interesting question because there's been an article that i, re I read recently about um criticizing virgil about his collections with off-white right saying how he kind of plagiarizes things and how he doesn't necessarily um fess up to it and how he's kind of um i don't know he's maybe redefining what we categorize as um, referencing and copying and all that kind of malarkey, right? No one's really quite sure what to make of it because obviously he's so blatant with it and, and he's kind of made, I think he's mentioned in interviews previously that, you know, he kind of doesn't see it the same way that other people do see it, right? So I'm kind of going to get the, the the actual article up here from um, Virgil and then we'll go through the uh, the kind of book from Raph Simmons. But the book itself is fucking amazing. But I just want to quickly check read this for you where is it here it's on the fashion law one of my favorite websites for all fashion industry news or you know stuff concerning this stuff so here it is right it's not to call in the fashion law it's called the irony of being off-white i'll get up on here on the screen so there you go so this uh, so this article on the fashion law, maybe think about this Raph Simmons book that came out recently. It's a Raph Simmons tome, it's a Bible autobiography, um, or an, an archive of all of Raph Simmons' most important pieces that he made from 1996 to 2006 in two volumes, 200 pound, boom, both uh, glad as you're on. But this article on um, fashion law, maybe think about it, it's called um, The Irony of Being Off White. And effectively, here's how it starts off in the beginning. Um, the article says, before the first model even stepped onto the lengthy Louis Vuitton runway on a sunny day in Paris last June, to initiate the most anticipated show of the season, Virgil Abloh was already being accused of copying the white ceramic link uh, chains that he had teased ahead of his debut for the world's most luxury, valuable luxury brand looked a bit too much like the ones previously put forth by Tanya Henry's highly followed Louis, uh, Los Angeles jewelry brand. Just days prior, hordes of commentators of commenters uh, began flooding Ver Abloh's Instagram to point out the similarities. Those same social media users were also quick to note that this was hardly the first time that Abloh had taken too much of inspiration from another designer thereby making this part of a larger conversation one that has compared the similarity of Virgil Abloh's offering from his own label of white to those of Raph Simmons, Pia Moss, um, Grams, uh, Coles, Lucio Fantano, Ondler, um, some of these names I have no idea who they are, um, Angry Large which probably a benefit for Virgil, Prada, Calvin Klein, Philip Lim, uh, Elisa Von Julin, Hel Helly Hansen, Balenciaga, New Models, Nike and many others. Fucking hell. Um, these are some of the names that have linked um, to the designs of Off-White creative director and Louis Vuitton menswear director in recent seasons and not in a collaborative way but in an endless appropriation as George as Garage Magazine, Garage Magazine put it um, a kind of way so um, this is of course a, another example of supposedly um, Virgil Abloh copying I think these are the, the, the images on the right so or yeah the images on this side where my arrow is on, a, on your probably left hand side of the screen these are the original kind of designs by a young I think it's Parisian designer I'm not too sure I, I think I remember reading a, a, a kind of caption they wrote on Instagram where they were ranting they're saying how they met Virgil outside of a show they showed him the designs and then a few seasons later he kind of does this for his off-white label um, same sort of kind of motif you know yellow um, um, track pants with um, graffiti all over it um so anyway so that's basically the conversation going on here now right virgil abloh copies everyone and he's he says it's referencing and i think he mentioned somewhere in this article the quote that he says what he says it um da, da, da. 
Hot is on planet. What do you say? He said something like referencing or something. What do you say? Is, is it referencing? Reference. Yeah, there we go. So uh, he, he said something along the lines of, in his words, um, Marshall Du not Marshall Du Camp is um, yeah. So here it goes. So this is kind of Virgil's kind of um, rationalization for why he thinks that works well for him, right? So it says um, this is part of the status quo that is widely in widely in demand. Virgil and his um, band and his brand of white, the latter of which has named the hottest on the planet uh, late last year by fashion search site um, list. Um, yes, Ablo rather no notoriously rejects the "who did it first" mentality of previous generations in favor of copy and paste logic of the internet and its inhibitions, right? So his idea is that you know. The idea that um, you're, you could um, do away with any kind of references, lock yourself in a room and come up with original ideas, Virgil kind of probably feels like nowadays with the access to the internet and how we're all hyper-connected, it's kind of basically impossible to do that, right? You, if, if you're not referencing something, you're referencing something unconsciously, right? Something that you've maybe seen, you maybe touched, we're all kind of referencing things. So there's no difference between doing that than actually taking reference from things that you've seen previously, elevating in some way, giving them a little twist or whatever maybe, right? Going by his like 3% rule where he kind of tweaks things. That's his kind of rationale behind it um and in the words of zero three two c uh the berlin-based magazine that's one of my favorites um in his own words marshall du marshall du camp is his lawyer a reference to the late um artist practice of taking already existing elements and elevating them as art uh, if you're familiar with marshall du camp he's familiar he's the kind of legendary person who took the urinal and kind of elevated it and put it in the middle of a contemporary art museum right so with that being said he kind of thinks maybe compete isn't that big of a thing right on virgil's case but i looked at his book from the idea bookstore and it kind of got me thinking right about uh what where is it where's the book where's the book where's the book? There you go. it kind of got me thinking about um you know copying and archiving all this sort of stuff just in terms of you know past designers because i think i think a lot of people have maybe seen of recent years that maybe ref simmons is probably you know coming up to the not He's maybe running out of juice, maybe running out of spark, right? Nowadays, right? He's not as influential. He's maybe not as important to the kids as he was to maybe my generation or generation prior. He has still a loyal fan base of kids out there who will buy like archive bomber jackets and pieces and stuff like that for thousands and thousands of dollars. You see them going up on um, on Grailed or on other various kind of like um, vintage um, fashion Instagram pages all the time. But for the most part, the kind of kids nowadays want new, fresh energy and maybe Ralph Simmons isn't necessarily talking to them or want to speak to them in general, right? He doesn't really have his finger on the pulse, which is where Balenciaga, Vetema, um, Gucci, all these kind of people, Virgil, Off-White and Louis Vuitton, that's where they kind of step in because they know kind of what the kids want. They can kind of do that easily. So this, is there something to be said for if Ralph Simmons is running out of juice, right? And he is kind of responsible for maybe playing a big role in what we see as modern menswear nowadays, right? Maybe reshaping what we think of streetwear is. If that is true, is there is there a rationale? Is there is is there ever a justification for young designers to go into the archives, um, take one of Raf Simmons' best hits, things that are probably going to test stand the test of times, right? From pants to jackets to shirts to accessories, things that you can just wear now and no one will know that it was made in 1996. Is there a justification for designer for taking that stuff now and reinterpreting it in their own way and putting it back out again, again for customers to buy? Is that not a good way of kind of making sure Raph Simmons' legacy lives on forever because of all these codes that are being carried through into other people's lines and collections? I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I, I'm not too sure. I'm not really sure about it because I, because I still think I'm not really, I'm not really sure if the kind of like, you know, if like copying is the right way to say it, because I think referencing is probably the better way to say it. Um, because you're not exactly gonna take a Ralph Simmons jacket and just like copy it, wait, um, you know, thread by thread and just make it again. You're obviously gonna do your own tweak. Everyone does that. That's probably why that's probably the main reason why everyone gets into fashion, right? You wear you wear clothes and you start to realize, oh, there's stuff, stuff some things that you want to wear that you can't find in the market and you just do it yourself. So there might be some things that you like about Margella, some things you might like about Rick, some things you like about Raph. But then you're always going to apply your own little twist and present it in a new kind of way, right? We're kind of seeing the fruits of that with what um, Jerry Lorenzo is doing at um, Fear of God, right? He started off a bit, you know, Ricky, Saint Laurent, Dior, um, kind of like, you know, look in the beginning. And now he's suddenly kind of taken those codes, interpreted it in his own way and kind of done his own thing, right? He's got pod shorts that look, that look you know, super like Fear of God pod shorts, even though they probably started from the Rick Owens inspiration. 
right? He's got flannels and boot and desert boots that kind of started from maybe the common project Saint Laurent kind of model, but now they look like Fear of God shoes. So maybe that is more of a homage um, of the great work Hadi Semen did at Dior than it is for kids to just hoard stuff from like 17 years ago. Maybe. And looking at this Raph Simmons book, I would imagine loads of young designers coming up, right? This is the book I've got now on, on the screen. We'll just take this book and basically copy some of the pieces um, thread by thread and just change the words, right? This t-shirt here that says heroes. Just same font, same color, changes to villains. Uh, same font, different color, changes to villains. Change the font, put it upside down, right? It's not that hard, right? People can do that like straight away. And probably, and maybe that's the reason why people will get upset with the whole reference of figured Virgil because they kind of deem it to be like an easy exercise, right? It's not, you're not actually testing yourself, which I kind of, again, I disagree with. I still think, you know, it's one thing just taking that shirt and flipping the words upside down or changing the font. It's another thing being able to do it at the right time, get it to market, um, get um, get awareness for it and also sell it um, and have it on people's backs. It's really, really a different thing. Um, yeah. Again, I'm not too sure because I think if I was a kid and I was coming up and I was, you know, enamored because I think that's how we all start, yeah, isn't it? I know that's how I started. I started doing this podcast because I was listening to Barbell Buddha, um, Chris Moore, RIP from... Uh, Barbell Shrug doing his solo podcast and I started listening to Bill Burr I started listening to Joe Rogan I started listening to Tim Ferriss and that kind of got me started on my thing right I know when I used to play football I used to pretend I was Ronaldinho right and I wasn't but you know I'd hope that when I if I'd got better at playing football that I'd get my own style we all start off doing that we all start off kind of imitating somebody because we look up to them we want to be like them and then we suddenly kind of get in our own groove I don't really think there's anything wrong with that personally um so yeah, it just it just it just opens up an interesting question for me in terms of what referencing is, what referencing, what, what people would deem referencing is. It's not exactly copying, um, and because maybe you know, starting that conversation, you start getting into the Zara stuff and whether or not what Zara's do is kind of ethical, and you know, they just sit they just sit down wherever they are in their studios, browsing Vogue.com, checking out all the kind of, you know, the kind of themes that are running through collections and then adopting it in the kind of mainline stuff, for, for, especially for the women. The women's stuff is insanely good compared to the guys. Like, they take, like, you know, especially when Phoebe Philo is around. If you're a girl and you like Celine, like, you could pick up some amazing pieces from uh, Zara. Um, so, yeah, that made me thinking. But anyway, this book is available now in ID, Idea Bookstore. It's a Raph Simmons tome. Um, I think only 200 have been made, I think, or something like that. Uh, no text, just um, just numbers. Two big, two black books, two, 1996 to 2001, and 2001, 2006. Between the two books, two 700 pages, and that means somewhere in the region of 700 pieces and a four decades of Ralph Simmons. Um, how much? I think it's 200 quid. I'm pretty sure. I'm not sure what how much how, how many editions of it are do exist. Though. Uh, twen we have 20 copies to ship today. And second drop to follow. Okay, so it's not that many copies to be honest. I'm surprised it's still a lot. Again, that goes to show just how um um i want to say relevant that's not the right word he's probably not as popular as he was once was before there's five available now online only so they sold 15 of these books but these should be flying off the shelf immediately right they shouldn't be there um so yeah um raf simmons archive book and again archive books are the best in it being able to catalog or document everything you've done throughout your career is probably a great feeling but yeah raf simmons archive book available now on the idea bookstore i got it up on here on the screen check it out idea bookstore is 200 quid for those of you that want to buy things of that nature there you go yeah anyways um what's next on the list there blah 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 what else do we have yeah, uh, 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 so weird. So there's this politician that recently got put into jail for something that doesn't really make no sense to me. And she's still an MP, which is fucking bizarre. So this lady, Fiona Onasanya, um, which is, again, you don't really hear people getting put in jail because they um, run a red light or jail or for, you know, going over the speed limit. But this is an interesting story. So an MP has become the first sitting member of parliament in nearly three decades to be jailed after she lied to police over a speeding ticket. Solicitor Fiona Onasanya had denied being behind the wheel when her car was spotted dry, uh, being driven at four, 41 miles per hour in a 30 miles an hour zone in 2017. Is that it? She was 11 miles over. Um, Pia Brown MP was thrown out of the Labour Party after being convicted of perverting the course of justice. She has been jailed for three months after a retrial. How do you get jailed for three months of being 11 miles an hour over the speed limit? The court heard evidence. Oh, Sonia was texting as well as speeding during the summer recess. Um, 
Osanya is the first um, sitting MP to be jailed since Terry Fields was sentenced to 60 days for failing to pay his poll tax. She has stated that she intends to appeal the con against her. Her brother, uh, Festus, was jailed for 10 months for his involvement after pleading guilty of the same charge. How do you go into jail for 10 months because of because you went 10 miles off? Whoa! Um, six weeks before the committed offence, she was ousted. Uh, um, da, da, da. As, 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 as he sentenced her, MP, Mr. Justice said, um, you, have not, you have not simply let yourself down. You have let down those who look up to you for inspiration. You're part of your profession, the parliament. Her life as a new MP in 2002 was extremely hectic and chaotic, and she was just being diagnosed with multiple sclerosis when police began to pursue her, she noted. The so, if her son had been jailed for 12 months or more, parliamentary rules state that she would have automatically lost her seat, but she still keeps it, even though she goes to jail for three months. That's mad. With your jail term, however, she instead faced what's known as a recall petition. Under new rules introduced in 2015, it means residents can force a by-election if the petition is signed by more than 10% of the Peterborough electorate. However, because her son has lodged an application to appeal against her conviction, the petition can't be open until the process is complete. Once it's open, Jesus Christ. That is mad. Imagine speeding over 10... Imagine only speeding 10, over 10 miles an hour of the limit and you get put into prison for three months. Obviously, she probably won't do three. She might do half, right? Or maybe do a month on good behavior because I'm sure she probably doesn't have any prior conventions and stuff. But God damn it. Has been most of the story that means I don't know the details. So I'm not going to go into it. I'm not going to drop the race card. But yeah, um, that doesn't seem that doesn't seem legit, does it? It doesn't seem legit to me. Um, but hey, ho, what do I know? Um, next on the list here, Jeffrey Owens SAG Award appearance. Yeah, this is a fucking great hot woman story. Do you remember Jeffrey Owens, the guy that used to be on the Cosby Show? Do you remember what happened to him last year? No. Okay, you don't care. I know. I understand. But so Jeffrey Owens is the guy who's been on the Cosby Show. And, um, you know, uh, since then, his career hasn't necessarily gone as planned. He's kind of stepped out of acting. He's now kind of got a regular job doing, you know, just a regular, regular job stuff. And um, I remember last year, you know, as one of the kind of byproducts of public shaming, because, you know, public shaming has kind of rose to pr prominence um, in the last few years or so, because, you know, people have felt like uh, celebrities or people in power haven't necessarily faced the same consequences that the average person on the street would for some of the heinous crimes that they do. So in a way to kind of rebalance, uh, uh, you know, put the scales back in balance of some sort, people have now begun public shaming or have they been doing this since yesteryear, but now it's become more prevalent, especially in the internet age, in order to kind of get people to kind of um, face the consequences of the actions, right? And uh, Jeffrey Owens was kind of um, got the wrong end of the stick of this because he was, you know, he was on the Cosby show, he was a big celebrity in his time, and then you know life kind of you know life goes on you can't you've kind of not you're not in the limelight anymore you just go on doing your regular regular life right and you kind of started working at trader joe's like a, a regular kind of supermarket in america and um somebody a shopper in trader joe's saw him and recognized who he was and recorded the video of him kind of bagging up groceries and kind of put it out on on twitter now to be fair to the lady that did it it that it didn't seem malicious it didn't seem like she was saying oh my god look at this celebrity he's so sad he's now working a regular job right i didn't think she was job shaming him i think her intention of sharing it was more along the lines of like oh shit you never guess who's bagging up my glow with groceries right of course it's still tasteless of course you shouldn't be recording people at their job just doing their minding their own business he, he's been working there for i think a while and no one really said anything like everyone comes understanding you know be respectful give people get, have, have, have let them have dignity in their role and it kind of got out on social and luckily i was happy to see that people on social didn't react well to it right they're like oh this woman's a bitch why'd she do that that's sort of disgusting and um, um everyone's kind of vilifying her for job shame even though she probably didn't job shame and and, Je and jeffrey owens also stepped up and kind of spoke quite well about the kind of pride he has in having a job and how he's able to provide his fire for his family and how you know he was once an actor but now that thing's over and he's living his regular life like just you know regular smuggler shit and it seemed quite cool and it seemed like a really good response but um so far the kind of you know the acting world the entertainment world has been quite gracious with him and kind of re-embraced him or in involved him back into the embrace even if it might be only temporary but it's great to see him back again in that kind of hollywood glow and he was at recently at the sag awards um i think sag is like the representation body for most actresses i think in hollywood and shit um so he was there um and he kind of got um he kind of got i think he got announced or something on the on the stage i want to put a quickly video here if you guys can see listen to this quickly boom 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 so i think you got a knowledge of that sag awards right yeah. and this is quite nice to see actually hello hi uh what i'm about to tell you is a true story 
I was born in Canada, a country that have a, yeah, right? <laughs> um, a country that heavily subsidizes their arts. When I was 17, the Canadian government had me fill out a vocational training test to see what it is that I should do for a living once I graduated high school. I sent it to Ottawa, and two weeks later, the Canadian government determined that I should be a movie star. <laughs> Absolutely true. I am the specter of big government. My name is Mike Myers, and I am an actor. Awesome. You let your films get highlights. That's awesome. Man. Really cool, right? So they let him get a little speech into. <laughs> so somewhere in the middle of the road of my life, I found myself in the dark wood of unemployment and debt. But instead of switching careers like a sane person, I took a job at a local Trader Joe's to see if I could hang in there with my career. Awesome. And um, it's actually worked out pretty well. That is so cool, no, right? So that's amazing. So they allowed him to give like a little monologue at the beginning. Um, and it's a really heartwarming story. It actually makes you want to cry, man. I'm, I'm really getting emotional about this, actually, man. It's just cool because, you know, sometimes, you know, I don't know why it is. People like humility um, when it comes to people that have, you know, um, that have fame or have notoriety or that are well-known. There's lack of humility that we have because I don't know why, because I don't know why it is. It's probably a, a human per uh, precolition, precolition, whatever it is, it's probably something um, that's deep inside of our core. But something about, it, especially in the 21st century, automatically assumes that because we see that person on TV, because we see that person in the limelight, that they automatically should be happy because they've got that, right? As soon as you get that, you're happy. That's all Mikey, what you think. That's probably what, that's probably why people are so enamored with the idea of winning the lottery, right? Or if I win the lottery, all my problems will go away, right? Everyone, all, it's just a kind of like, you know, age old um, myth that we have in our heads. So we sometimes lack, um, we lack sometimes the um, compassion um, towards people who are in the limelight. And this story was another example of just how regular schmegular an actor's life is compared to everyone else, right? They're in the same predicament we are, it's just another job, right? So this um, Jeffrey Owens saying, which I didn't actually know at the time, I said in the beginning wrongly, he was actually still trying to be an actor and he took a job, a job at Trader Joe's specifically so he could be, continue being an actor. Because if he decided to switch careers, decided to do like, you know, a full-time job, right? Like I do, like most people do, work five times a week. He couldn't be an actor because he couldn't go to auditions. But if he takes a job at Trader Joe's, bagging groceries, you know, stacking shelves and shit, he could just call his manager up in the morning or the day of and say, hey, I can't come in today. I'll take, um, can someone cover me? Or I'll come in tomorrow because I'll go on audition. You can you can do that because those kind of jobs allow that flexibility, right? And they in, in order to give the flexibility, they kind of hope that you would then pay them back by, you know, doing double shifts or coming in on the weekend, blah, blah, blah. So that's the reason why he did that role in the did that thing in the first place and there's something really um admirable about having that level of um humility grace dignity in accepting that all i need is money and i'm going to pursue my dream it doesn't matter what i'm working at, i want to pursue my dreams but in the pursuit of your dreams even still still you're still working on act shows whatever you have to imagine you're still having to work that trader joe's job because you know most acting gigs even one that i did when i did a little bit of an extra work um your check doesn't come in for another six months i'm sorry another six weeks sometimes right so you're constantly waiting for another check to come for another job so you're constantly having to keep these little part-time jobs going and then you're having to secure auditions in the hope that suddenly you might land a series gig a big movie that's going to kind of pay out a big amount that you can then decide to kind of portion out throughout the rest of your years going up right now but I just think it's an amazing story about having pride in your work that you do and also being humble enough to understand that what you do doesn't define you, man. It doesn't define you. So what? I'm bagging groceries at, at Trader Joe's. Even if he wasn't trying to be an actor and he wasn't just doing that to feed his family and to keep a roof over his kids, that's still amazing because in the, the day when Christmas comes around, he's going to be able to buy his children gifts. He's going to be able to take his, din his wife out to dinner on, on fucking Valentine's Day. And that's essentially what we all want to do. We don't want that much, right? We want to be able to buy um, Gears of War when it comes out new. We want to be able to buy that new pair of trainer. We want to be able to go to a, a festival. That's all we want for the most part. It doesn't really matter what the means are. It doesn't really matter what, what you're doing. There's no need to job shame. It's not as if like some of us or most of us have the jobs of our dreams. Most of us are only working in position because we need to work in order to kind of keep our bellies full and keep a roof over our heads, right? And actresses, celebrities, athletes, entertainers, they're the same as us. They just happen to work in an industry that's maybe on TV, right? Um, that's it for the most part. 
they're exactly the same as us and you know they have the same trials and tribulations that we do sometimes even even worse because imagine it being an actual actress you're consistently having to have a, you're consistently having to impress people in order to get jobs you're consistently having to sell yourself consistently having to be like <sighs> smiley jumping around performing all the time just to get jobs that's that's you every day is a gatekeeper day so I think it's amazing, man. It's really good to see Jeffrey Owens in that good spirits. It's great to see SAG welcome him back into um, open, open arms. Again, if nothing transpires of this and he doesn't get any roles or he's just welcomed back in and he's somehow given a kind of, I don't know, they kind of, what they give him, patron, but, you know, I don't know, he's kind of supported in some way. That would be cool regardless. Or he does, um, um, I don't know, um, classes for kids and stuff coming up. That would be awesome as well. I'm just happy to see it um, overall. Somebody finally getting a good shake of the stick when it comes to the public shaming malarkey that's been infesting the internet. Um, blah, 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 blah. Where is it here? I said, oh, did I not hold it here? Where is it? Oh, no. I thought I had it on there, but I don't. Do I not? Oh, yeah. So, talk about... Um, Talk about public shaming. A great little video came out the other day, actually, I saw on, on YouTube. A great little documentary made by uh, this guy called... Uh, so stop it. It's from a YouTube channel called, I think, Coffee Break. I'm going to quickly get it. Hopefully it loads because it's taking a bit slow, this internet today. It's the morning time slowness, pardon. Pause this. Cool. So it's uh, called Public Shaming. It's from a channel called Coffee Break. I'm going to quickly play a bit of it now. And then I'm going to quickly talk about what... This is kind of like going around the back of the stuff that's happened with Jeffrey Owens, right? Do, 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 do. Show a little bit there. Let's play. In 2015, if you were in Minnesota going in to get your regular teeth cleaning at River Bluff Dental, you would have encountered a bizarre, unsettling scene. These are just some of the signs that vandalized an abandoned dentist's office. The reason? Walter Palmer, a dentist working there, had gotten into deep trouble for trophy hunting in Africa. But Walter's problem wasn't with the law. He had the correct hunting permits. His business was in shambles because he had killed Cecil the Lion and the story had gone viral. An outraged internet mob quickly rallied, determined to make Walter pay. He is just disgusting. He is despicable. Poor Cecil. I mean, he's despicable. He's Facebook. this woman. She's about to cry, right? So this is the story about Cecil the Lion, right? That um, dentist that went abroad, killed this lion, and um, posted it on social media. People got outraged, continually barraged, barraged him, um, and went to his dental practice. Eventually, got his dental practice shut down. He had to move his practice to another location. Um, and this kind of um, video kind of explains, you know, the why public shaming has come into prevalence, why it maybe has. Um, kind of gone a bit OTT and overboard but essentially um I won't play the whole thing but you can check out yourself I'll put a link below in the in the show notes but essentially the kind of thing that made me thinking about it and kind of got me a bit sad was the up the kind of we same with the Jeffrey Owens is the um, public shaming in some cases might have a merit right there might be a rhyme and a reason for it because you know some sometimes the court of law is moves too slow and people it takes long people to convict it sometimes people don't get convicted if they had the right representation there's loads of things that could happen right but the idea that people could be shunned or shamed in public for things they've done it's great i'm all for it what the problem that i have is that when people get shamed nowadays it's cancel culture they want you to be over they want you to be done they don't want to ever see you again they don't ever want to see you do another movie do another film your career is meant to be over completely meant to go in hiding and that's the thing that i don't like because i think they mentioned in the video part of public shaming back in the days right um was that you would be public shamed in a kind of town square and then you'd be kind of welcomed back into society and you're given the opportunity again to kind of you know redeem yourself right that was the kind of post behind it the shame was what happened in the public square everyone saw what happened to you you got you got maybe you got maybe whipped you got maybe um people threw rotten fruit at you whatever it may be what may be happened right but then afterwards you were kind of welcomed back into society people kind of welcomed back in and said you know you can kind of learn from this but nowadays it feels like if you make one mistake it's over it's done and you're completely finished the other thing that really kind of bums me out is the collateral damage of it, how it affects those around you that have nothing to do with the situation, right? And um, that goes for loads of people that commit maybe kind of heinous crimes. But in public shaming cases, for the most part, the punishment usually outweighs the actual crime itself, right? Quote, unquote. And the people that suffer the most are those around you, your family, your friends, the people that you work with. For instance, this guy, the dentist, dude, right? 
he works in a he's own his he's owns his own um dental company or firm, whatever you may be calling it, right? Practice. And imagine the receptionist that works there. Um that's probably I don't know, that's bouncing two two jobs or that has three kids, a single mom or, you know, the dense assistant or the cleaning guy, the janitor. Imagine all these people losing out on a job because um he made a mistake. That's the problem that I have about it, right? They're making him shut down his thing, make move it to another place. And now if you watch the video, it actually mentions that this dude that killed this other lion, he's now, you know, I think four years on, he's moved his practice to another location. And even still now, they kind of consistently spam his uh, Yelp page of his business with low ra ratings, low reviews uh, because of what he'd done four years ago by killing this lion in, um, in Africa or wherever he was in a safari. Um, and that's a side of it that really kind of annoys me. Like I will get, I get the public shaming thing, but kind of let's just balance it out. And I don't know whether or not it's going to happen. I don't know whether or not we're going to actually reach a point where we're going to see things kind of simmer down a bit because it's kind of got a little bit too crazy, especially on the back of the kid that was wearing a MAGA hat with the American Indian dude. We saw the kind of mistake that happened there. We saw, um, we've seen quite a few actually mistakes of um, people that have been said something bad happened, but it did actually happen. We've seen something happen recently with Chris Brown. Um, he got accused of rape in Paris. And then it transpires that the girl that accused him of rape is a known crazy person. And she was doing it for the quote unquote clout. And it's just, it's just a complete mess. Right. And especially for, especially if you're somebody that's already in the bad graces of the public of society, as soon as you do something like that, people are very, very quick to say that, oh yeah, you definitely did do it because they want to see you lose anyway. And that's something that I'm kind of a bit bummed out about and something I kind of hope in years to come, we can kind of look back on and say, oh, we kind of went away. We kind of went a bit too far with this. Again, that's the hope. I'm hoping it happens, but this documentary, a little short video really highlights it. It's only like 11 minutes long. I recommend you check it out. It's called Public Shame. I'll link it in the show notes for those of you that want to see it. Anyways, um, moving on up, moving on in. Mm -mm -mm. What do we have here? Da, da, da. Ah, LV earbuds, right? Oh, no, actually, you know what? Let's go here, right? So, uh, number one collection I want to talk about is this high snobiety, is this um, article on high snobiety about the Diamond Co Supply Coca Cola capsule collection, which I think looks pretty cool. Again, it's not, you know, it's nothing. Um, uh, it's nothing uh, crazy. It's nothing that's going to kind of blow you away in that respect. But I don't know. There's something just quite cool about the execution of it overall. Um, I'm not sure what it's promoting or what it may be, but let's just quickly um, check this out on the page. So there's this collaboration happening now with Diamond Co Supply, um, famous for the Tiffany Dunk, uh, founded by uh, Nick Terche, um, famous for, you know, starting off being a kind of skateboard hardware company. And then they kind of went into streetwear, roasted prominence during the whole um, L.A. Fairfax um, era of streetwear with Ben Hundreds and Bobby Hundreds and all those kind of guys. Right. Um, so uh, Diamond Co Supply doing a collaboration with Coca-Cola and they're dropping a Coke White collaboration. Right. And um, I'm not sure if they're actually part of actually a line, but it says here, editor's notes, it says on this High Snobiety article, um, the Diamond Coast Supply, uh, cheekily named Coke White Capsule Collection, is a collaboration with Coca-Cola, Naturalist of Clean White Pieces. Da, 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 da. I'm not sure if it was actually because they're releasing a, a Coke bottle that's white, but essentially it's all white pieces, which is, you know, again, you know, on the old Yayo front. But it's really cool, I thought. It's quite clean. Um, I like how it looks. Um, there's a pair of Air Force Ones there that look really cool. Um, a nice hoodie with um, all white text on it, Coca-Cola Coca written on the front of it, with diamond on the back, T-shirts done really nice. I'm assuming in really nice fabrics, a skateboard deck, a uh, pair of jeans. The Air Force Ones don't look at that um, luxury though, so I only think I'm disappointed about I thought the Air Force Ones would maybe be a little bit more premium. I thought maybe they'd use more premium levers. They don't look that, that premium to me. I quite like the leather embossed logo on the back heel there, to be honest um but yeah they look fresh there's nothing i like more than a pair of clean air force ones and you know a pair of coke fresh air force ones get it uh -huh. coke um are, are probably even better and they've got you know a little bit of white um they've got a white um lace there the front there that i can that I always throw away when i get my air force ones but all in all i think it's a pretty fresh collection man i quite like the look of it I'm liking what Nick is doing with Diamond Supply now at the moment. I'm sure they still do their regular brand, right? Remember, remember how popular that Diamond um, Supply T-shirt was, the Diamond Co Supply hoodie. That was like our box logo back in the day, man. Before box logos came around, I'm not sure if kids still care about it in that way anymore. But that was so nice. Um, I just realized, are those jeans or are those? I'm not a fan. Are those jeans with drawstrings on them? Oh, not a fan of those at all. 
I hate drawstring jeans, man. Drawstring jeans and cuff pants are one of my are one of my kind of like you know um, no nos when it comes to clothing. But it looks pretty cool. I like it overall. A coat collection by um, Diamond Co Supply. Check it out. Um, when's it coming out here? Let's get a bit of dates on there for those of you that like shopping. It's coming out January 27th. So it's already released a couple of days ago. Um, January 27th. Diamond Co Supply collaboration with Coca Cola. Da, 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 da. Next on the list here, we've got these fucking shitty LV earbuds. I don't understand what the fuck's going on with these Louis Vuitton earbuds, right? I don't know. Someone needs to tell me what I've missed out on. There's this video I'm going to play now of uh, Little Yatty talking about them, right? And I, again, I just don't know what's happening. I don't know if I've missed a boat. I don't know if I'm getting old. I don't know if I'm just not involved or I'm not hip enough. I don't know what the hell's going on with this. Um, I'm going to quickly show you this video and then we're going to quickly talk about this. Um, I don't know what the fuck is happening. I don't know. 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 Let me quickly get this on there. Da, da, da. Multi channel device. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Let's get this up on screen. Show. Okay, there. I hope you can see this. Play. Please. And case in point, let's stop this. Are uh, Little Yeti's hands um, dry on purpose? Like, is that like a thing that he's doing just to kind of make the video more funny? Because obviously he's got like a suit on with no t shirt, with no kind of shirt. Um, and he's kind of, you know, burying his Louis Vuitton, his Apple earbuds because he's got Louis Vuitton earbuds now. But again, this is a funny little video regardless. Louis Vuitton AirPods. I know you thought you were rich, but. And I understand, but you're not rich. This is real wealth. Real wealth. Bear your AirPods today. I don't honestly. I don't get the hype. Maybe I, I, I think it's Black Twitter did a good job with Apple Air, with AirPods. I always found Apple AirPods right to be really shit to use. Right, they always drop out of your ears. They don't really make any sense. And then they come out with these Apple AirPods, which look essentially like a regular AirPod with just the fucking cables cut out, with a little bit sticking out underneath. People swear by them when they use them and stuff, but I've never really got the hype. And now to make it even worse, Louis Vuitton have come out with a collection. Now I'm not too sure if this is Virgil's doing, because um I think only rappers got these first, right? Lil Uzi, Lil Uzi Vert, Lil Yatty, and a few other people got these first. I'm not sure what exactly is happening. This is a Virgil Abloh kind of activation, or if this is maybe Louis Vuitton kind of just stepping on it. But um, this is an article I found up on The Verge talking about it. This is a um, Louis Vuitton logo on these earbuds will cost you $700. $700 for his fucking... Jesus Christ, right? Um, Louis Vuitton um, announced a new pair of truly wireless earbuds, the Louis Vuitton Horizon earbuds that cost $995, featured a fashion brand's iconic logo. But despite a new paint job and name, these aren't new earphones at all. They're the Master Dynamic MM07 buds that came out last year. Instead of costing you um, already too expensive, two ninety nine, you'll pay an extra $700. So the, the, the ones that they're based on are $300. Master Dynamic have already uh, have uh, was already angling for the high fashion end of the market by adding things like asymmetrical design and conventional colors that were meant to help the MW7 um, earbuds stand out. So a Louis Vuitton collaboration makes sense. In his review, my college. My colleague Stefan Irton noted that the MW7s were comfortable and sounded good, but they simply weren't worth three hundred dollars uh, price tag. Since there's so many cheaper ones on the, on the option, of course, from you know from the Apple AirPods, which are one sixty dollars, to the Jabbar Elise, which are one seventy, and you got other stuff like the. Um, the J Bird and all those kind of malarkeys they make them. Aside from the Louis Vuitton style, there are the Horizon earphones appear to virtually identical to MW7. Louis Vuitton appears to be selling these three different colorways of the Horizon earbuds. The touches. I just, again, I just don't understand what's happening. Maybe I'm out of the loop and I don't get what the kids are doing, but I just don't get why these are a thing. Um, I'm I'm involved with the wireless headphone things. I think I finally got into the wireless headphone stuff because I'll get my running. Uh, a friend of mine introduced me to kind of noise cancelling headphones, and even with noise cancelling headphones, I've seen I've seen um a lot of people wear them nowadays. And again, as soon as someone mentions something to you, you notice something, you start to pick them out in the audience a bit, or in the kind of you know commuter base that you're going to on a train with. But for the most part, you're still seeing the same old brands, right? Beats, um. Apple AirPod, AirPods, all that kind of malarkey on trains. And it made me think that as shitty as these headphones might be, the power of branding really does supersede the quality of your work, isn't it? Because, you know, you're not ever going to convince anyone, really, by, by and large. I think people have kind of seen this. The general consumer isn't necessarily going to go out and buy those Bose or those um, Sony noise cancelling earphones, right? Uh, because um, they're not, or headphones, sorry, because they're not trendy. They haven't got collaboration behind them. They're not a feature in a trendy advert. They're just standard um, headphones for audiophiles for the most part, right? 
And if you kind of, if you see why I'm talking about their headphones, the uh, Sony's and the Bose, you'll know what I'm speaking about. But unless you know, don't, unless you know them, you won't notice them on the street. But the things you notice on the street straight away are what? Beats by Dre headphones and Apple AirPods. And I've used a pair of Beats by Dre headphones. I didn't rate them too highly sound wise. I think they, I think they, um, they burn pretty well. And in the first couple of months, they sound good and then they kind of drop off. And the Apple AirPods, again, I've worn AirPods before. Every time I get a new iPhone, the first thing I do is chuck away the headphones. I never really got hyped about headphones. Even when we had Air, um, you remember um, back in the day when you used to have like Apple iPods and, you know, the whole idea behind it was the advert with the white earphones and shit. I didn't care. I'd always go buy a pair of Sony headphones. Nowadays, the Sony headphones aren't as good, but or buy a pair of Bose headphones, like earphones. I didn't care about the actual earphones. Those weren't a thing to me, but... For a lot of people, branding is literally the thing, right? That's the problem. That is the thing. And maybe AirPods are such a status symbol nowadays that if anyone does them, like if Gucci comes out with one, Supreme comes out with one, I won't be surprised. Um, they're going to sell out like hotcakes. Like if Supreme came out with their own kind of Air- Apple AirPod, like it'll be insane. It'll be, or oh, like wireless headphones, it'll be fucking insane. It'll be insane. Um, and yeah, it's just, just a bizarre world to me personally. How you'd buy, so this uh, this base model is $300, but you're going to buy the branded one for 700 it's not even in the same ballpark. It's like, shit. But yeah, um, good luck to all you guys buying Louis Vuitton um, Apple Air, um, AirPods or whatever they're called. Um, I am not involved. Don't get me involved. Count me out of that 100%. Um, no, thank you. No, thank you. Anyway, that's the Exodus English Show episode number 151. We're an hour in. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been an absolutely amazing show as per usual. Thanks for lending me the ears. As always, um, link below for all my dates and stuff i'm djing this friday in dawson at the free compasses from 9 to 12 30 so if you're in the area come down and see me play and until then i will catch you guys later peace